jaundice, which doesn't have the most intuitive name, comes from the French jaunisse, meaning yellowing. It's also sometimes referred to as icterus, though, the origin of which is even less intuitive, coming from the thought that jaundice could once be cured by looking at a yellow bird. Well, the more you know, right? Anyways, as you've probably gathered, jaundice involves someone taking on yellow pigments, specifically in the skin and eyes. The yellowing pigment is caused by a compound called bilirubin, a component of bile and the main cause of bruises being yellow, and, after its metabolism, the yellowness of urine and brownness of feces. So since bilirubin's our main culprit of yellowness, it's super important to know where it comes from. As red blood cells near the end of their lifespan, which is about 120 days, they're eaten up or phagocytized by macrophages in the reticuloendothelial system, aka the macrophage system, where the spleen plays the largest part. But it's also made of parts of the lymph nodes. Okay, so first the macrophage eats up the blood cell, and hemoglobin is broken up into heme and globin. The globin is further broken into amino acids. The heme, on the other hand, is split into iron and protoporphyrin. Protoporphyrin is then converted into unconjugated bilirubin, or UCB for short. Unconjugated bilirubin is the form of bilirubin that's lipid-soluble, meaning it's not water-soluble, right? Albumin in the blood then binds to unconjugated bilirubin and gives it a lift over to the liver where it's taken up by hepatocytes and eventually conjugated by an enzyme called uridine glucuronyl transferase, or UGT, making it now water-soluble. At this point, the conjugated bilirubin is secreted out into the bile caniculi where it drains into the bile ducts and is sent to the gallbladder for storage as bile. Now, when you eat a donut or something, your gallbladder secretes the bile which has the conjugated bilirubin in it. And it moves through the common bile duct to the duodenum of the small intestine and is converted into urobilinogen, or UBG, by intestinal microbes in the gut. Now some of that urobilinogen is reduced to stercobilin, which is excreted and responsible for the brown color of feces. Some of that urobilinogen is actually recycled though, and it gets reabsorbed into the blood and spontaneously oxidizes into urobilin most of which is sent to the liver and some of which goes to the kidneys. It's then excreted and is responsible for the yellowness of urine. And there you have it, bilirubin metabolism in a nutshell. Now if some point in this process gets disrupted, for example if your liver cells are damaged and can't conjugate bilirubin anymore, or maybe if they die off and release their bilirubin, you can end up with increased bilirubin in the blood, which can be either conjugated or unconjugated, or both. And this is what accounts for the yellow color in the skin and the eyes. Usually it takes about 2.5 milligrams per deciliter or greater of serum bilirubin to give the skin that Simpsons-esque yellow skin tone. The earliest sign of jaundice and increased bilirubin in the blood is this yellowing of the sclera of the eyes. Scleral tissue is high in elastin, which has particular fondness for bilirubin and binds it with a very high affinity giving that scleral tissue in the eyes a yellow color often before the skin. Now, as you might imagine, after looking at this process, there are quite a few potential pitfalls along the way that can lead to jaundice. And they're lumped together depending on whether they have more unconjugated bilirubin in the blood, or more conjugated bilirubin in the blood, or more of both in the blood. Two types of disorders that have increased unconjugated bilirubin and similar presentations of jaundice are extravascular hemolytic anemias, where red blood cells are broken down earlier than they normally would be, and ineffective hematopoiesis, where your blood cells don't form quite right in your bone marrow, causing macrophages to break them down. In both cases, the red blood cells are broken down, right? Causing high levels of unconjugated bilirubin. Since your hepatocytes can only work so hard converting unconjugated bilirubin to conjugated bilirubin, they can get overwhelmed. As an imaginary example, Say that this liver cell can conjugate 10 molecules of unconjugated bilirubin per minute, max. But normally they only see 5, so that's easy. If all of a sudden your body starts breaking down more red blood cells, and the unconjugated bilirubin molecules on this cell's docket jumps to 15 per minute, this liver cell cannot keep up. And that excess of 5 molecules of unconjugated bilirubin stays in the blood, right? And that's only the first issue. In addition, as the liver cells max out, 
Now there's all this conjugated bilirubin that goes into the bile, which increases the risk for pigmented bilirubin gallstones. Not only that, once all that conjugated bilirubin is sent to the duodenum, it's converted to urobilinogen. And remember that some of that urobilinogen is recycled back into the blood, oxidized to urobilin, and excreted in the urine, giving it a much darker color. The unconjugated bilirubin is not excreted because it's not water soluble. In the previous two cases, too much unconjugated bilirubin was created. But you can also have hepatocytes that just can't work hard enough and keep up with a normal load. Physiologic jaundice of the newborn is one of these cases. Newborn livers have a lower amount of the enzyme UGT in the liver to convert unconjugated bilirubin. And after birth, unconjugated bilirubin levels can be high due to the natural process of macrophages destroying fetal red blood cells. Typically, this is normal, but there can be complications if unconjugated bilirubin rises a lot. Since it's fat-soluble, it can collect in the basal ganglia of the brain, which is also called cernicterus, and cause damage to the brain or death. Treatment of this condition is usually phototherapy, which uses light to induce structural and configurational changes in the bilirubin molecule. Basically, it absorbs the energy from the light and changes shape. And these new shapes are more soluble and can be excreted in the urine. And this can be a super effective and non-invasive way to get excess unconjugated bilirubin out of the blood. Another potential case where not enough unconjugated bilirubin can be conjugated is through hereditary defects. One case is called Gilbert syndrome, where the UGT enzyme activity is low and has a hard time cranking up when needed. So maybe this liver cell can only pump through a max of six molecules per minute. Unfortunately, if something comes along that increases hemolysis, like infection, stress, or starvation even, the unconjugated bilirubin load will increase, which can easily overwhelm these hepatocytes, cause buildup of unconjugated bilirubin in the blood, and lead to jaundice. Another genetic example is called Kriegler-Najjar syndrome, where Gilbert syndrome was a low amount of UGT enzyme. Kriegler-Najjar is where there's pretty much no UGT enzyme at all, and therefore no ability to conjugate the unconjugated bilirubin. And this will lead to super high levels of unconjugated bilirubin in the blood, and likely lead it to being deposited in the brain and cause cernicterus. For this reason, Kriegler-Najjar syndrome is usually fatal. Alright, so the previous couple examples focused on high levels of unconjugated bilirubin in the blood. But there are also examples of jaundice with high levels of conjugated bilirubin in the blood. Dubin-Johnson syndrome is an autosomal recessive disorder where there's a deficiency in the protein that helps move conjugated bilirubin from the liver cells to the bile ducts, called MRP2. So the conjugated bilirubin builds up in the hepatocyte since it can't go anywhere. It's thought that when the MRP2 transporter is defective, another transporter, MRP3, is upregulated. This transporter is different, though, in that it moves it to the interstitial space and the blood flow, as opposed to the bile coniculus. So in this case, you'll have increased conjugated bilirubin in the blood, which also gets excreted into the urine, giving it a darker color. And this also causes the liver itself to get very dark. Another high conjugated bilirubin category of jaundice is called obstructive jaundice. And this is basically where something blocks the flow of bile. And these blockages could be anything from gallstones, pancreatic carcinomas, and cholangiocarcinomas, to parasites like the liver fluke. Remember that bile is made up of conjugated bilirubin, and this blockage basically causes pressures to rise in the bile ducts, which literally causes bile to leak through the tight junctions between hepatocytes that line the walls of the bile ducts. But that's not the only thing that leaks out though, right? Bile salts, bile acids, and cholesterol can all get into the blood. If they deposit into the skin, it can lead to itchiness or pruritus, but also lead to things like hypercholesterolemia and xanthomas. That excess conjugated bilirubin is excreted in the urine since it's water soluble, which again leads to dark urine. Also, since you're losing a lot of bile, you won't be able to absorb fat as well, which, one, causes you to excrete a ton of fat, a condition called sciatoria, and two, causes you to not be able to absorb as many fat soluble vitamins as you need. Finally, viral hepatitis leads to both conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin in the blood. When hepatocytes get infected and start to die off, they both lose the ability to conjugate bilirubin, leading to excess unconjugated bilirubin in the blood, 
And since they also line the bile ducts, when they die, they let bile leak into the blood, causing an increase in blood conjugated bilirubin as well. Again, since conjugated bilirubin is up, patients will have more conjugated bilirubin excreted and darker urine. Thanks for watching. You can help support us by donating on Patreon or subscribing to our channel or telling your friends about us on social media.